if you're John Jones, you didn't actually beat the heavyweight champion, which was Francis Ngannou. So you're going to be called into question until you fight Ngannou. Unless you start to call out Francis Ngannou and Ngannou doesn't come back, then you get legitimacy either by beating him or not fighting him because he decides not to come back. Broadcasting live from an undisclosed location. This is the community MMA with your host, Chris Cross. Dana White Privilege. Dana White Privilege. Dana White Privilege. Dana White Dana White Privilege. Dana White Privilege. Dana White Privilege. What up, what up? This is your boy Chris Cross checking in. This is the community MMA. And of course, in the last episode, we put UFC 285 behind us, at least for the reactions. Looking at the predictions, 11 and 3 last week. We got a big week. And moving forward at UFC Vegas, 71, Petorian versus Marab Davalashvili. And we're getting into all that. But first and foremost, John Jones and Francis Ngannou are going back and forth. And this was kind of to be expected following UFC 285, where John Jones absolutely dominated Cyril Gant. And from the looks of it, John Jones is doing what he should do. He's starting to say Francis Ngannou is running from the new champion. In fact, he ran from the champion before he became champion. And John Jones said more or less that he's using every excuse not to fight him, saying, I highly doubt it. Speaking of the potential fight between him and Francis Ngannou, I highly doubt it, especially after uh, that first performance as a heavyweight. He continues to say, like I said, the dude left for a reason. Came up with every demand and request in the world. He knew that UFC wasn't going to bend. He found his way out. And maybe this is true, maybe it's not. But the fact is, is that now you have questions here uh, for both John Jones and Francis Ngannou. If you're John Jones, you didn't actually beat the heavyweight champion, which was Francis Ngannou. So you're going to be called into question until you fight Ngannou. Unless you start to call out Francis Ngannou and Ngannou doesn't come back, then you get legitimacy either by beating him or not fighting him because he decides not to come back. So John Jones is doing the right thing. He's got to make sure that he's looked at as a legitimate champion. And that's exactly uh, what he's trying to do. He's trying to legitimize his UFC belt because... You know, even if he goes in there and fights Stipe, so what? Stipe uh, lost to Ngannou. He lost the belt, right? Ngannou is the bona fide heavyweight champion, at least until he left and John Jones took over. So despite the big win for John Jones. Unbelievable, bro. Unbelievable performance by him. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, bro. But he's not going to be legitimate until he beats Francis Ngannou. So this is why you're beginning to see him put Ngannou on blast, start to call him out. He wants uh, that title fight to legitimize himself. And if he doesn't get it, people are going to be highly upset. Everybody's upset. Everybody's upset. Everybody's upset. Because these are the two best heavyweights in the world. And would it go down the same way like it did against Cyril Ghosn? Would he be able to take down Ngannou? before getting blasted with one of those powerful punches? Would Ngannou come out like he did against Rosenstrike and try to finish John Jones in 22 seconds? Is that even possible? Well, right now we don't know. And that's kind of what uh, we all want to see, is what would happen if these two squared off. Now, since UFC 285, we didn't update the dude list the next day because I knew this was going to take me some time. And in fact, I did this last night and I sat there for an hour trying to figure out who to put where because John Jones completely shook things up with the big win. And 
you know, we got a shocker for you. And the shocker is John Jones moves to number two over Islam Mahachev. That's what I was debating. And also Colby Covington had to drop way down. He was number four, but he's not fighting. So that led to me trying to figure things out. We also got Shavkat Rachmanov up at number eight. Of course, you got Hamza one, John Jones two, Mahachev three, Yuri Prohaska four, Aljamain Sterling five, Jamal Hill six. And that's going to be a, a tough one for me when Prohaska fights Jamal Hill. But I'm still leaning towards Prohaska at least right uh, right now. Then you got Volkanovski at seven, Rachmanov at eight, The Sugar Show, Sean O'Malley at nine, Colby Covington at 10. And then when you start to round the corner for 11 through 20, Adesanya just dropped from 10 to 11. Of course, he could move way up with uh, a win over Pereira and capture in the belt. We got Leon Edwards at 12, fighting Kamaru Uzman. Then you still got Charles Oliveira at 13. I mean, it's a lightweight division. Nunez, Raul Rosas Jr. at 15. Bo Nickel jumped to 16. Marlon Vera fighting soon at 17. And you got Patty Pimblett, Marab Tavalashvili fighting this week. And you got to put Alexa Grasso in there uh, with a stunning victory over Valentina Shevchenko. And that's just kind of how this thing shapes out, at least right now. And the interesting thing I'm starting to see is there's a lot of rising guys. Bo Nickel, Raul Rosas Jr., Shavkat, Rachmanov. How good is he? I mean, he looks even better as long as Hamza doesn't go down to welterweight. And what I want to see happen is Shavkat win welterweight and Hamza win middleweight. And eventually they're forced to fight, even if it's a catchweight or Hamza has got to go down something. But that's a fight that I absolutely want to see in the future. And as these rising contenders come up, they're going to start putting out the big names, the Adesanya's, uh, you know, all the other big names that are up there, Colby Covington, if he doesn't fight. So there's going to be a lot of changing in the guard, and that's what took so long to get the do list up and running this time around. Now, let's quickly move into uh, UFC fight night this Saturday night. You got some big fights, and of course, we're just going to start with the main event because you got Piotr Jan taking on Marab Devalishvili, number two versus number three in the Bantamweight division, and Piotr Jan's back is against the wall. We're five and two on the year, so this is a big prediction. Check it out. In the Bantamweight division at UFC Fight Night, you got two of the best in Piotr Jan coming in at 16 and 4. Number two contender taking on Marab Devalishvili. Number three comes in at 15 and 4. So this is going to be a, a straight up battle. Jan comes in one inch taller at 5 and 7. He's given up one inch though, 68 to 67 for Marab. Now Piotr Jan, switch dance fighter. Marab stands right handed. Jan lands more significant strikes per minute, 5.3 to 4.2. But the takedown game is the difference. You know, Jan will get like two over the course of three rounds. Marab is looking at two every round. So you're going to have to defend those takedowns if you're Jan. But the good news is 90% takedown defense, although it will be tested in this fight. He does have good and solid takedown defense against Sean O'Malley at six takedowns. Uh, but trailed 84 to 58 in significant strikes and lost. Lost to Aljamain Sterling by split decision. Beat Corey Sanhagen. Now, he trailed in significant strikes in this fight by 20, 169 to 149, and still snuck out the victory. Uh, and before that, he lost to Aljamain Sterling on DQ. So he's lost three of the last four, sliding a little bit. So he's going to come in with his A game, uh, needs a victory, or he'll lose four of his last five. That won't be good for him. Now, Davalashvili. 78% takedown defense. Beat Jose Aldo and Marlon Moraes in his last two. Also, Cody Stammen, John Dodson. The list goes on and on. And this guy is on a tremendous, tremendous eight-fight win streak. So he's surging right now. And for me, it's hard to see Piotr Jan lose another one. But Marab is a good fighter, man. It's really going to be a very close fight. But Marab's going to find a way to win. The drama between him and Aljamain Sterling is going to continue to heat up uh, because they're teammates and don't want to fight each other. And I think Marab just keeps winning. He's going to move to 16-4, likely by decision or maybe late uh, finish. But he'll win this fight. 16-4, Bantamweight division, UFC fight night. Yeah, so we are going with the underdog. <clears throat> and it's crazy because Marab Tavalashvili, as good as he is, 
is more than two to one underdog. And I think this is because people recognize at least those putting money up, which is, you know, the real predictions, if you will, are saying that Pitori, uh, Piotr Jan has his back up against the wall and he's going to win this fight. You know, he can't afford to lose three out of the last four. So with his back up against the wall, he's likely to come in and get the job done. And, and that's why you're seeing him increase more and more over the last few days, becoming a bigger and bigger favorite. Negative 250 for entertainment purposes only. That's more. Uh, that's two and a half to one for uh, Piotr Young. So we'll see what Davalashvili can do. Now, he, he's up against it, right? He's given up about one significant strike per minute. That could be 25 over the course of the fight. But his takedown game is ridiculous. And how will uh, Piotr Jan be able to deal with that is the big question. But, you know, the odds makers believe that he's going to be able to stop the takedowns and get the win in this fight. But it will be highly, highly interesting. As we move forward into the co-main event, you got a big heavyweight fight. Volkov versus Alexander Romanov, a guy that was surging and then took a loss, uh, but he's not done yet. And this is an opportunity to get back in the win column. Let's get right to it. In the heavyweight division, UFC fight night. You got an interesting matchup here between Alexander Volkov and Alexander Romanov. Now, Romanov is a guy 16 and 1. Uh, Volkov, 35 and 10. Ever the veteran come in, he's 5 inches taller at 6'7". 5 inch reach advantage, 80 to 75. He stands right-handed. Romanov stands left-handed. So lots of differences already. Volkov, uh, pretty fast-paced, high activity, nearly five significant strikes per minute. But it'll be interesting to see how he matches up with a left-hander. Uh, Romanov, 3.8, so not quite as much. But he lands about five takedowns over the course of three rounds. So then my next question is, what's a takedown defense for Volkov? Well, it's 71%. Not bad. Uh, but he's going to have to try to keep the fight standing. For sure. Now, he did beat Rosenstrike in his last fight. Big one. First round KO. Before that, he lost to Tom Aspinall by armbar submission. Now, Romanov uh, lost to Tiber in his last fight. Majority decision. But before that, he was uh, on a run. Winning five straight in the UFC over like Chase Sherman, Jared Vanderay, Juan Espino. But now he's starting to get some bigger fights against more of a veteran class of fighters so things are going to get much tougher and plus he lost a Tibera Volkov beat Tura so that makes it a little bit easier for me I like Ander, uh, Alexander Volkov to win this fight with the height and the reach but the takedowns could be a problem so keep an eye on that he's got to defend takedowns and he's tall which opens the door for Romanov to get takedowns so keep that in the back of your mind in this one but I like Volkov to still pull it off to move to 36 and 10, keep it standing where he's got the advantage here in the heavyweight division at UFC fight night. Yeah, and that, that's got to be the biggest concern is, is how tall he is. Tall guy, you know, if, it, if I'm getting into it with a guy that's shorter than me, it seems like they always got the edge on takedowns. They're already lower to the ground. The head is closer to the hip. All they got to do is dip and shoot, and it's very tough to stop when you're taller than your opponent and your opponent is very good at takedowns so that's the that's the concern but here in back-to-back -back fights in the co-main event and main event we're going with the underdog Volkov uh, a slight underdog uh, up against Romanov so you know we're going with Volkov and Davalashvili both underdogs um, in the final two fights at UFC Vegas 71 now in the fight of the night to me we always save this one for usually last Right, unless it's one of the top two fights, but the the most overlooked fight on this card, right, is going to be Saeed Nurmagomedov versus Jonathan Martinez because this is a true test for Nurmagomedov. It's going to be the toughest test so far in the bantamweight division at UFC Fight Night. A big one, a big one. Saeed Nurmagomedov takes on Jonathan Martinez. Both guys got 17 wins. Nurmagomedov two losses. Martinez four. Both guys have been fighting a lot lately. Three fights each in 2022. Both won all three. They're both 5'8". They both uh, have a 70-inch 70, 70 reach. So they're even in both of those areas. Uh, Nurmagomedov stands right-handed. Martinez stands left-handed. That's where the differences begin. Martinez more active. 
in significant strikes, 4.8 to 3.6 for Saeed. Uh, but keep an eye on the takedown game. Although they haven't really been existent for either fighter, they're both landing just like one takedown over the course of three rounds, but I think it'll become a factor in this fight. Now, Saeed, 63% takedown defense, beating Kakramanov, Silva de Andrade, uh, and Cody Stammer, which that's a big one to me. Now, on the other end, Martinez beat Cub Swanson, uh, Vince Morales, and Alejandro Perez. So they got some big victories over somewhat quality opponents, but they both got a lot of wins, and someone's going to be in the upward uh, direction after this one. But when you got the name Nurmagomedov and Medov on your back, you really got to take a hard look at this guy, and he's a very tough competitor. But Jonathan, De Mar Jonathan Martinez is no joke. Make no mistake about it. The activity worries me. But I'm going with Saeed Nurmagomedov to win this fight. And it's hard to say how. Because when you look at the numbers, they're not there. But he still wins. So I like him to figure it out. And move to 18-2 and two here in the Bantamweight division at UFC Fight Night. Yeah, so we're going to go with Nurmagomedov. But Jonathan Martinez is a really good opponent. And it could certainly go uh, against Saeed. And as I peek into... The odds, which weren't up the other day, Saeed is actually a heavy favorite, more than two to one uh, favorite to win this fight. So, you know, the odds makers are here on this one, but I'm nervous with Jonathan Martinez because this guy could step up and anything could happen in this fight because we're going to continue to find out as Saeed moves up is how good is he and at what point does he run into the wall if he ever does, meaning at what point does he get a high enough contender that He's not that good. You know, he does have two losses on his on his record or his resume. But right now in the UFC, he continues to win. And, and that's what's important. Now, as we move into uh, the Q&A, you know, you got some stuff from over the weekend. We're just going to give it all to you as we get through it. Now, Kenneth Bruner says, hey, Chris, after seeing Bo last night, I don't think he is ready for any ranked opponent. He need the guy... Uh, in the groin badly and then didn't know how to uh, get the finish more or less yeah but you got to remember he won in the first round he still won and when they reviewed the tape there's no conclusive evidence that there was a low blow and like they say in all styles of fighting you must protect yourself so while uh, his opponent is complaining while Jamie Pickett is complaining to the ref Bo Nickel doesn't stop fighting because time wasn't called and he still won in the first round uh, first round, excuse me, Bruner, great fight. Speaking of uh, Jeff Neal and Shavkat, however, you can't compare Shavkat and Hamza. Hamza is levels above Shavkat, and this fight proved it. The takedowns and grappling of Hamza are magnitudes above Shavkat. Yeah, and I agree. There's no question about it. And I, but I don't see Hamza going down to welterweight right now. So if Shavkat can continue to win and get the title, that will be good for Hamza because people would demand to see that fight, especially if Hamza is the middleweight champion by that time and I know y'all think I'm crazy when some of y'all think I'm crazy when I start talking about Hamza in this way but until he loses listen that's the way you're going to continue to hear me talk because I don't believe this guy is going to lose especially especially in the middleweight division where he's beefed up and feeling good Hugo Scully says I agree with you Anton is going to win this speaking of Anton Turkal taking on Vitor Petrino this week at UFC Vegas 71 yeah we like Anton to get the win. This is, you know, we got a lot of contender series fighters coming up on Saturday. EP man, Duplessis wants the big money fight against Hamza. I think Hamza should take it. Yeah, and I think both of them should say, listen, we'll fight, but the winner gets a title shot. Then Hamza's in, Duplessis is in, the UFC forces a big fight. You know, Forget Duplessis. He's going to bring some fans, but Hamza will bring the viewers as well. And knowing that the winner gets a title fight, it's going to be a big time fight, which Hamza will win. And you see Duplessis hang on and hang on and hang on against other fighters. Hamza will close that door in the first round. Kenneth Bruner says, great move, easy money for Hamza. Yeah. And that's why I'm hoping they hype this fight up because it'll be worth it to wait almost a year to see Hamza fight if he gets he's guaranteed a title shot with a victory. Then it's worth it. Damon Archery says, Dreykus will take Hamza, bro. <laughs> no way. Dreykus Duplessis has no chance 
against Hamza Chamayev. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> Not even a chance. And Trey, John Jones grappling is too much for heavyweight. He is going to run through all of them like this. And I think that's why people want to see Nganu come back because that might be the one guy that can at least have a fight against John Jones. But right now, yeah, I mean, he's calling out Stipe. I mean, come on, Stipe? Stipe's on the downward decline, no offense. 3 Lev 888. Uh, looking at Pittori and Marab, he says they both are Georgian. This one may end up uh, uh, Piotr's way only because it will mean less to lose someone similar to him. They come from similar backgrounds. I'm surprised by how much yap yap is going on between these two. I'm not because it's a fight, man. And you're getting into a cage and you're locking the door. And regardless if you're, I mean, from the same country, yeah, there's a brotherhood there. But at the same time, this is a fight, and whoever gets the win can easily get a, a, a title fight next. Or if O'Malley doesn't fight, at least if Marab wins, he gets a fight with O'Malley right away. Oliver Gabinet says, this age well, laugh out loud. Speaking of uh, Jalen Turner, will destroy Matouche camera. Yeah, so you picked the one. Listen, we went 11-3 and three over the weekend. You picked one of the three that we missed out of 14. You know, but it's all right. I can take it. I can take it. And I still think Jalen Turner fought well, and he lost by split decision. So it it is what it is. I thought he looked good. Matush Gamrot just held him, and that gets you to win, but not very exciting and not building a big fan base by doing that. But it is what it is. Matush Gamrot did get the victory. Make no mistake about it. Kenneth Bruner is back. Jones, Hamzad Agan. If anything, we learned. Bo Nickel is nowhere close to fighting competitively with ranked opponents. I would disagree. Shavkat isn't anywhere near Hamzat's ability. I agree. Jones made Gan and everyone hyping him look dumb. Jones is going to be the Hamza of heavyweight. I agree. So two out of three, I agree with you on. But I do think Bo Nickel is ready for uh, highly ranked opponents. But I, I just say, why rush it? No need to rush it. Let's take our time on that one for sure. Uh, Jorge Diaz says, Alexa Grasso had been practicing that very move in which she submitted Shevchenko. I mean, yeah, she looked uh, great doing it too, man. Congratulations to Grasso. That was an impressive win against the longest reigning champ in the UFC. Kenneth Bruner, he groin shot at Pickett and only then took him down. Then on the ground, he didn't know what to do. He needs massive MMA work before a ranked opponent. He is uh, not the next Hamza nowhere near. But listen, he's got the ability. And what's going to happen, in my opinion, Bruner, is that Hamza is going to win the title. There's not going to be anyone that can really match up with him well. Bo Nichols going to be the guy that rises. He's going to keep winning. And that's going to lead to at least a massive showdown uh, in which Bo Nichols, the one guy that could at least go to the ground with Hamza, probably still going to lose. Don't get me wrong. But at least a guy that people can get excited about. So that, that's where that's headed. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, I'm a big Hamza fan. I think he's going to continue winning and nothing is going to stop him. But listen, it's been a good show. We got to get out of here. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Lots of predictions uh, continuing to come your way. Make sure you subscribe to the channel at youtube.com backslash the community MMA. If you listen via Spotify, Apple Music, wherever. This is your boy, Chris Cross. Hope you have a great day and God bless. Peace.